Land in Africa. It is so important. Land is life. Agriculture is the backbone of many African economies. 80% of the population on the continent relies on natural resources and the population is growing rapidly. Land in Africa. It is degrading. Farming is becoming more difficult. Biodiversity is lost. Precious water runs off and takes topsoil with it. Estimates are that one third of the land in Africa is degraded. Land degradation is a key driver of extreme poverty, conflict and migration on the continent. Now for the good news. Restoring land is not only possible, it can also have a huge impact on food, soils and livelihoods on the continent. Two billion hectares of land worldwide have the potential for restoration. And in Africa alone is about 450 million hectares of land where there is still potential for restoration. Bring this into context now when you talk about food security, poverty alleviation. In Africa, when you map poverty, food insecurity and hunger, it quite correlates with degraded landscape which means that fighting hunger, bringing zero hunger in Africa, is about restoring the degraded landscape. We know the science is telling us that climate change will disproportionately affect Africa. Africans will face extreme temperature uh, effects. We're already seeing weather patterns that are extreme in the drought and in the rain and floods. And Africa also stands the least chance of adapting. We don't have the technology and the resources that most countries have in the West. So we must be most concerned and we must start where we know we have a lot of potential. Africa has a lot of people and we can put a lot of trees in the ground. The potential for restoration through tree planting is great. Potential for restoration through natural regeneration is equally great. Africa has huge potential for land restoration. You can find tried and tested solutions on the continent already. The World Future Council and the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification have identified solutions that contribute to the protection of life and livelihoods in the drylands. What are the policies that work well for land restoration in Africa? Tigray, Northern Ethiopia, 6 million people, 80% smallholder farmers, a dry mountainous landscape. Tigray's highlands are densely populated and in the past people have degraded the land. When this fragile balance disrupted, catastrophes such as the 1984 famine happened. Estimates are that the famine affected 8 million people, leaving 1 million dead. The famine convinced a majority of the surviving people that only if they fundamentally changed the way they lived would there be a chance of survival on the land. Today, traveling through Tigray is a mind-blowing experience. Hill after hill after hill is terraced. People are claiming they moved more stones than it took to build the pyramids. Years ago, people left the valley of Merere because there was no water, there was no food. Then they came back and started a miracle. These hills have seen 30 years of soil and water conservation work by the local community. Government and donor-funded programs have supported this work. Today, the water flows and 1,500 hectares can be cultivated in Merere. Farmers are growing teff and sorghum. They are harvesting papaya and mango and cutting grass for their animals. 
livestock is not allowed to roam free because the hills are protected. And the hills pay back. They shed water. Today you can walk along this irrigation canal for 9 kilometers and the water just flows. In February, before the farming season starts, the farmers of Merera will set out again to work on the canal. They are planning to add another 11 kilometers. Tigray policies have been recognized as the world's best policies to combat desertification and land degradation by the World Future Council. A combination of three policies received the organization's Future Policy Award in gold, the only award that honors policies rather than people. The conservation-based strategy of the government, which puts smallholder farmers at the core of development, Campaigns that mobilize people to contribute 20 to 40 days of voluntary labor per year and a policy that allows youth to use land for income generation if they restore it at the same time. In Ethiopia, Almost 6 out of 10 farm households cultivate less than 1 hectare of land. When productive land is scarce, how can young people make a living in rural areas? Restoring marginal land, steep hills for example, is a solution. A youth group in Malfa Tigray has terraced a steep hillside. They are planting onions in winter and a whole range of crops like tomatoes, lentils, cabbage and spices in summer. Another group of young people has planted a steep hillside with trees and started honey production. With the youth group there is significant change in our life. We are 30 members in the group. At the beginning, there were some problems, especially in guarding the beehives. But now my husband is employed as a guard with a monthly salary of 1,000 beer. We now are producing better products. We pay back the loans for the beehives by selling the honey. The income we generate by selling firewood and grass for fodder, we spend on food or pay into a savings account. Once we have paid back our loans, we are planning to expand the businesses. We want to purchase mills and start a milling business for TEF. Land in Africa Nearly half of the land on the continent is used as pastoral land, as range land. Pastoralists in drylands are adapted to a fragile and harsh environment. As their land degrades, nomadic pastoralists move on. Conflicts with local farmers over resources arise. What if there was a way to restore the enormous pastoral lands of Africa? Globally, a method is emerging which is challenging common ideas. It is called holistic rangeland management. The method is inspired by the huge herds of the Serengeti. These herds graze and browse intensively, but then they move on and do not return for a long time. This gives the land time to rest and recover. Holistic rangeland management adopts this idea. Livestock should not be allowed to roam freely, but should be moved in a big herd according to a grazing plan. Namibia has adopted a national policy which reflects the method of holistic rangeland management. It works with principles rather than with rules and regulations. 
It encourages farmers to know their resources, to manage for effective rest and recovery, to improve soil condition. This is a farmer-driven policy, and the implementation is organized through farmers' unions and farmers' associations. Our farmers can definitely really learn from it. If you're actually looking at the cattle, they are very calm. And as you see around, they're actually in... Well, the condition is not that perfect at this point of the year, but uh, they're actually reflecting what you're actually seeing on the land. It been a very long, dry season, and uh, the rain just started. But as you look at the ground as well, nothing has improved yet. So they're really reflecting what's actually on the land currently. Yeah, but however, I think the program is going well. They are very calm. They are actually also quite uh, in productive states as well. The policy have been launched in 2012 by the Minister of Agriculture and Water and Forestry. So, and ever since then, we will try to uh, take it to the farmers to inform them about the policy. Well, definitely it should be able to make a difference. Surely the farmers also are aware that the well, they cannot be cattle farmers without not being able to look after the, the land. They can only really farm profitably while simultaneously also taking care of the rangeland as well. Yeah. In Namibia, the policy focuses on farmers on communal and private land. But do you actually have to own the land to restore it? In Ethiopia, all land belongs to the state and people can get the right to use it if they restore it. In Jordan, rangelands also belong to the state and local communities are now involved in land management. Traditionally, Bedouin people in Jordan effectively governed their rangelands through their own land tenure systems and grazing rights. Nomadic Bedouins could also raise their livestock with no regard to political borders. When rangelands were declared to state land in 1956, this discouraged pastoralists from conserving the resource and led to degradation. In 2013, Jordan started implementing an updated rangeland strategy which involves local communities in land management, enhances their roles and responsibilities, and empowers local governance. It builds on the traditional local knowledge system of Al Hema. صار يجي علينا على الجمعية وعلى الحمى يعني علشان إحنا الستات اللي اشتغلوا معانا أرامل أمهات أيتام خط الفقر يعني اشتغلوا معانا كم واحدة في الباقي عندنا كثير يعني من الوضع حام يقولوا أي شيء إحنا نطلع لحالنا نقطف ونجيب لكم على الجمعية in Islamic law, Al-Hema is a natural area which is set aside for the public good and may not be privately owned. The concept is more than 1400 years old. Hemas help conserve natural resources and biodiversity. They integrate community life, ethics, animal welfare and more. Alhema encourages communities to build their own institutions to manage their rangelands. The Bani Hashem community in central Jordan has developed such a local tribal law and enforces the new land management system. After only a few years, the benefits are obvious. Indigenous floral species are back. Shrubs and grasses are regenerating. The women of Bani Hashem now cut herbs on the hills. They dry them and sell them as teas. Soil is one of the hottest topics in environmental discussions. Healthy soils store more water, grow better food, create diverse environments. Healthy soils can store huge amounts of carbon, 
which can help <laughs> mitigate climate change. The title deed that you have in whatever land that you own has, is making you also a custodian of the soil characteristic, the soil potential. If you own your land, you must be aware that the soil characteristics are not just yours, they are a global common. Many don't like to hear that, but it is just true. We need a change in the way we do agriculture, also from the point of view of managing our soils. We need to go away from some of the old uh, practices, which, although they may sound sustainable, are not necessarily sustainable. And why? It's because the farmer did not really take care of the life in the soil. Uh, so we need complex systems, um, and we have demonstrated this through research, that such complex systems increase the carbon in the soil, water retention, nutrient cycling, and uh, we have the methodology, we know it works. Again, why are we not doing it, is the question. Wherever I go, I say, look, we need to do that now. Actually, we should have started yesterday because we know what to do, how to do it. There's no reason why we're not pushing uh, more conservation uh, agriculture, which again includes regenerative agriculture practices, agroecology, organic agriculture. I mean, this is all goes in the same direction of uh, putting carbon into the ground because we know that's where it belongs to. We know that's where it helps uh, the cycling the nutrients, but also we know that it helps manage uh, the water in the soil. So many, many more benefits. With healthy soils, you can turn a desert into a productive farm. The second initiative in Egypt shows just how successful such a model can be. Every piece of land has to be turned from desert into living soil. Sekem applies biodynamic agriculture, which has a holistic understanding of life processes. Today, the top layer of Sekem's farm soils is rich in organic matter and microbiological life. Compost builds up empty desert soils. Healthy soils like this can also hold more water. What you can see here walking around are living soils. So out of that, mainly dead sand, yellow sand, you will see here brown, dark, black soils. And all this uh, organic matter and carbon, which has changed the color, is what makes these soils very, very fertile. We have also shown that we can handle the whole cultivation cycle with less water, 20 to 40 percent less water than our neighbors. And what is the most important is that we can do so by giving more people a job than any conventional neighbor in the, in the whole region. Biodynamic farming worked out very well for us. It's based on our black gold, the compost, which is really very, very, very important. But uh, as soon as you can handle a good compost production and really work on your living soil, then uh, desert land reclamation can be handled in a biodynamic way. The SECA model is based on biodynamic farming, but also on what we call economics of love, on a very active living, learning uh, organization and community building effort and on our continuous effort to build the individual potential of all of our members in the community. In the vision of my father who established uh, SECAM 41 years ago, it was always about unfolding people's potential, supporting the people to create a living learning organization and also develop themselves as a community. And everything else you can see here at SECAM, whether it's our plantations, whether it's our potatoes or oranges, whether it's our factories with machines and 800 million tea bags and so on. All these are considered uh, tools to achieve this development. So what is always in the focus is the development of each one of our members' potential. And uh, everything else helps us on this path. Today, the second group employs more than 2,000 people. 
Its core businesses are organic farming, plant-based medicines and textile production. The second companies include the largest packer of organic tea and the leading producer of herbs in the Middle East. Hundreds of children learn in second schools. Youth is qualified at a vocational training center and at the Heliopolis University of Sustainable Development in Cairo, which Sekem founded. Sekem received the Right Livelihood Award, also known as Alternative Nobel Prize. We know the solutions in policy and practice. Transformation of landscapes, harvesting of water, growing of good food in healthy soils. If the solutions are so clear and so tangible, there is only one more question to ask. Why isn't it happening? We tried to get the government to invite the stakeholders so that you know, they are actually managing the process. It's very difficult to get the right people around the table. And in addition to this, there's the pressure from development partners. And we've seen that a number of countries where actually a big interests of the private sector, which basically comes in on the back of major donor country, will push certain agendas which go against what the will of the people. So yes, we need the people involved in the discussions, but then we also need to respect those discussions and do what people want and not what a donor still tries to impose. You can go to a number of countries where basically, despite the fact that the farmers didn't want, we have built huge rice schemes against the will of the farmer. We bring in factories for fertilizer against, but farmers say we don't need it. So again, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of talk about certain things. The action actually looks different. And that's why we have to become much more serious uh, moving forward. If you want to really uh, transform agriculture, uh, the food system, we have to really uh, start to pay attention to, to what people really want. And I think if we were to listen more, work with them, with, with our stakeholders more, I think we would find a better solution. Involve all those that are concerned, especially communities that have managed it wisely, skillfully for so many years. If you take women farmers, for example, they are real skilled on farm. They are the ones who do a lot of the sophisticated work. And their knowledge base there is much, much more than our of us scientists put together. Who are we to say, you know, okay, here is what you must do. It has to be from bottom up so that we work together. So my point is, capitalize on the knowledge, indigenous knowledge base, but also add whatever you can contribute in, uh, by way of science. What is more important to me is the broad genetic adaptive complex, let's, let's put it, which has been developed over years, co-evolving with the environment. We don't want to lose that. Losing that means losing everything. Genetic engineering is not going to save uh, the, that diversity. It is, it is a reductionist approach, all right? So it might have its application. Uh, uh, but in, in the context, it's being developed and used. No. No, no way. Because it is profit-oriented, not benefiting the real owners, but rather those who have the money and the scientists that can manipulate it in whichever way they want. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. Political sustainable solutions for the key challenges of our time already exist. The responsibility lies with African policymakers and governments. They need to provide the right frameworks. They need to take the decisions. Diverse agriculture for healthy soils and thriving people? Or industrialize monocultures that benefit multinationals and an elite?
Everyone can play a role in fighting land degradation. Check your government's policies and make your personal contribution every day. The trouble is the misconception that Western ideas are superior and a good sign of civilization and modernization. Fast foods are coming here and that's it. You eat the young and the so-called educated. They just grab it. Eating uh, diverse food uh, is not fashionable, maybe. So people have to be educated. So when you look at you know, how to uh, improve resilience in agriculture, that would go via diversification of crops. You want a diversification in the plate. So it's, it's a demand issue. So if the people would start to think, well, we don't want to eat only maize, but we want more vegetables, we want uh, different cereals, the farmers could start to grow more uh, different crops, which would increase, again, you know, the resilience of his system. We must change the way we, we do agriculture. We must change, we must change, in fact, everything, because it is throughout the value chain of both production and consumption pattern. Landscape restoration will increase the availability of land for food production, will increase the availability of water resources, will increase the resilience of local communities to climatic shocks, will sustain the, the local and national growth, will alleviate poverty, will reduce food insecurity, will reduce resource-based conflict. I can go on and on. Sometimes I wonder why people don't see it. But maybe I need, and all those who believe in what I believe in, we need to do a better work in advocating for how crucial it is for the world to see that it is about the landscape.